What is not so obvious is how they view life, what they believe. Happy-go-lucky in the outside does not mean life without fear on the inside. It takes determined study to know them, and often the grim facts are not pleasant. As we studied their way of life and how they thought, one of the things that stood out was the constant fear and deception the people lived in. One area involved their dead ancestors. The men would dress up in a large mask and dance around the village. They believed that this was the spirit of a dead ancestor returned. The men told us that the women did not know that it was them who wore the mask. They kept the mask hid in a special place reserved only for men. They explained to us that if a woman ever saw the mask by itself, or if she let on she knew about the mask, and that it was only a man who wore it and not a spirit, for that woman the penalty was death. When I was a little boy, my mother saw the mask by itself. As was custom, my very powerful father asked my mother to die when he died. When my father died, my mother was shown the mask. Her two brothers took her to the woods. They did not want to, but they had to. Our beliefs demanded it. They put a bark rope around her neck. I was very young, but I remember it well. My mother was young. I loved her. My mother died because she saw the mask by itself. We lived in fear. Time goes by the day, the night, and they don't know. Children cry, men live, they die, and they have no hope. So many people just existing Are we really listening To the tears and the fears Of the unknown Oh, killing to live And living to kill Yet dying in their sin Their faiths are strong But they're all wrong their gods just can't win They tremble at the thought of them The sun, the moon, the birds, the spirits Oh, how can it be That they just don't know perfect son to die for them The son now reigns next to his father's throne But so many just don't know What you truly believe does affect what you do sometimes with tragic consequences well, a day does come, though, when you do know enough of their language and how they think to explain to them the Word of God. Now, the question is this, where do you start? The Bible is a big book, and none of these Mok tribal people had any previous exposure to God's Word. Before we could start teaching, we had to prepare Bible lessons. Our tribal language helper, who was not a believer at that time, was the key to getting the proper Bible terminology we needed. Even before we started to teach, the Mok seemed to sense a wonderful message was coming. When the teaching finally started, the entire village of 310 people gathered. We never mentioned Jesus Christ until after two months of teaching Old Testament foundational stories. The first day, we began by showing them a map of their village. Then we showed them where the surrounding Mok villages were located on that map. 
From this point, we explained to them progressively where they were located in relationship to the neighboring tribal groups, where in the province they were located, where the province was located in the country of Papua New Guinea, and where Papua New Guinea was in relationship to Australia, Japan, United States, and Israel. Then we explained how the Bible, God's talk, many years ago had come from Israel to Europe and then around the world and was now coming to them, the Mok people. In the second lesson, we discussed how different people groups believe they arrived here on this earth. The Mok people believed they were created by two different birds. When we told them that some people in our country believe they evolved from an ape-like creature, they said, they're stupid. We asked them, out of all of these beliefs, which one is correct? And they said, we don't know. Then we told them, this is why God has given His written word to mankind and it never changes. Starting with God, we explained what He is like, His attributes. Then we told them about Satan and his fallen angels. The Mok felt that hell is a fitting place for Satan and that God was right in preparing it for him and his demons. From there we taught them about creation and Adam and Eve and man's choice to sin. We explained how God promised a Savior who would someday come to deliver us from sin. Other Old Testament stories followed in which we emphasize God's greatness and grace, man's lostness in sin and helpless condition, and God's provision of a blood sacrifice through the killing of a lamb. Often we use drama to help them understand what we were teaching. When we told how God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, it presented a dilemma. Abraham was obviously a godly man, so he would obey God. But it was through Isaac that the Savior of the world was promised to come. I knew that somehow Abraham would obey, but God must save Isaac's life, perhaps with a substitute lamb. Before we finish the story, four different men individually suggested that Abraham would obey God but God would somehow intervene and save Isaac's life by providing a substitute lamb. They developed a sincere reverence of God and feared daily that God might rightly destroy them because of their sin. They said, we are just like those people in Sodom and Gomorrah. For two months, we taught key Old Testament stories chronologically before we finally introduced Jesus Christ as the Savior, born as a babe in this world. As we studied the life of Christ, they fell in love with Him and Jesus became the Mok hero. They loved Him and they idolized Him. Never during the weeks Mark taught did a villager miss a lesson, though he taught for three months, Monday through Friday, two times a day. Villagers that were sick were brought on makeshift stretchers, and when an expectant mother was near delivery, they arranged for her to be close enough to the meeting to hear the story. The baby arrived in the middle of one of the sessions, but the teaching still went on. At times the moke were so intense they stopped eating and would not even sleep. They spent every waking moment discussing the message and re-listening over and over again to the lessons recorded on cassette tapes. This wonderful Jesus was perfect and He could do anything. He was God. They finally came to explain the betrayal by Judas and the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. Judas' betrayal was upsetting to the most but they still had faith that somehow Jesus would escape. That was the last story we told them before the gospel presentation. At the end of it, we said, tomorrow we will finish our talk.
The next morning, the people were all gathered before sunrise. I told the story of Jesus appearing before Pilate. The people were very sober. When during our skit they saw Jesus being spit upon, beaten, and finally put to death, they were simply appalled. They were distraught. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Because the death and shedding of blood is so significant to the gospel story, we had rigged a balloon filled with colored water to be pierced by our designated Roman soldier. It was when they saw the blood that the story began to take on significance. Our explanation and portrayal of Jesus Christ's resurrection was simple, but to them, very powerful. The Savior was alive. Then I went back into the Old Testament stories and beginning with Abel, explained how Jesus was our acceptable sacrifice, just like Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God. When I finally reached the story of Abraham and Isaac, I said to them, Listen, just as a real lamb was substituted for Isaac, so Christ's death and blood has been shed as a substitution for you. At that point, the lights really went on. I could see and hear them responding all over the crowd. I believe! I believe! I believe! I stood in their midst and asked them what they thought. From all over, responses came like this. <laughs> I know I was born in sin. I believe Jesus paid for my sin, that he died in my place. He is my sin bearer. I lived in fear trying to please the spirits, for I knew no other way to be free from sin. But God in his grace has sent you to us. I've heard it and believe the death and blood of Christ is payment for my sin. I believe it and God has forgiven me. On that day, almost all the village expressed belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a sense of tremendous relief. The Mok are generally a restrained people, but as the gospel sunk in and new believers sensed the liberation from sin, spontaneous rejoicing broke out. Watch what happened. <laughs> Village believers stating that he too believes that Christ has paid for his sins. Itao, which means it's true or it's good, it's very true. Village grandma rejoicing that he believes, so does she. Different ones giving testimony as to their belief in Christ as their sin bearer. Mark saying that if they really are believing, then God's word says that their sin is forgiven. Itao, it's good, it's true. Spontaneous rejoicing breaks out. This went on for two and a half hours. We have considered your interest in our mission board, and I'm sorry we do not believe you are missionary material. You'll just be too old and possible.
Gloria, don't fret yourself so over those people. Consider your health. You have children. Mark and Gloria, as a church, we are standing behind you. We'll pray for you. We'll support you. Go in the Lord's name. In 1986, a remote tribe stepped into a new understanding of life. That understanding was gained through the Bible. The story was recorded in the video Itao, but the story has not ended. This is the next chapter. Mark, it's been real good to be able to spend time with you and your family again and to just hear what is going on with the Mok tribal people. You entered this tribe back in 1983. And uh, the way you found them back then, they thought a lot different than what we often think of tribal people. Tell us just about what that was like. I suppose one of the most common beliefs about tribal people is that they live in some sort of ideal society and that they're happy the way they are in their beliefs. What you're saying is, uh, is something I find is being very true. Uh, that's what people do think. And uh, what I'd like to do is, before we look at where the Mok people are today, I would like us to go back and take a look at where they came from. Now, in the previous video we made, Itao, uh, we described their society as originally being a society based on deceit. And in this video, we described how men would dress up in a mask, representing a departed ancestor, and then they would dance. We illustrated how if a woman let on that she knew it was only a man and not a spirit, then that woman would be killed. Okay, the question has been asked often. Uh, did the women know that it was just a man, or did they really believe it was a spirit? Hey, the women knew that it was just a man wearing that mask. They could tell by looking at the dancer's feet, and they'd see scars or broken toes or things like that. And those were clues, dead giveaways, as to who was wearing that mask. What if that woman let on she knew who it was? Okay, that woman would have to die. That's what the men told me. That's the practice they followed. Another thing that the men would do is tell the women to make a lot of food for the spirit of the mass. Now when I say a lot of food, I mean a lot. I've seen it, tons of it. That's no easy task. The food has to be dug up, 
carried in along slippery mountain trails, and then it has to be prepared. Then the men would have a big feast at night in the men's house, an exclusive place where no women were allowed. At times, they would have so much food that they'd literally have to throw it out behind the men's house where the women were forbidden to go. The excess never went to the women because they were supposed to believe the spirits ate the food. A woman would never complain about the injustice of the cultural belief because to do so would mean death. Fear bound their mouths. Frankly, being a woman was no picnic. Now that sort of information is really jarring to people who believe that tribal people live in that ideal society you hear about. Uh, binding fear, that sort of fear, is not associated with happy people. That's right. And speaking of fear, it wasn't only the women that were controlled by fear. The whole society was characterized by fear. In the Mok tribe and in many tribes. Sorcery is the most feared thing in life. For example, recently I heard a story about a man named Camaius. Apparently Camaius was a very powerful man that lived in Dongdongomu. One of his enemies from a neighboring village worked sorcery on him. The sorcerer caught his spirit in a can. Then he took it home and heated the can in the fire. As he did this, Camaius became hot with a fever. He knew sorcery had been worked on him. He was scared, so scared, they said, he cried. Finally, he died. Anyone who believes that these people are happy the way they are should go to one of their funerals. In our Western society, death is so plastic. An undertaker puts a person in a nice casket and the dead person is embalmed to make them look like they're sleeping. We have nice flowers and the speeches are all proper. We even have hope that the person is going to heaven. We have hope even if it is a false hope. In our Western culture, in the back of people's minds is the idea that if a person lives a good life, then everything will turn out happy in death. But in a tribal society, there is no undertaker. There is no embalming. They have no nice flowers. There are no proper speeches and there is no hope. Hmm. Well, a day did come when you could teach them about the hope that's found in God's Word, the Bible. But just to recap a little, tell us how you went about the teaching. Okay, and this is the part I really get excited about. We took the Bible, beginning at Genesis, we taught them chronologically, picking out key passages about God, who He is, what He is like, themes like sin, what it is, who is a sinner, the judgment of that sin, each theme and lesson is built on previous knowledge, so it's like a progressive revelation of God's Word. While teaching through the Old Testament the first time, the men began coming to me, wondering how to handle this whole area of deceitfulness. They were learning that all forms of deception were sin. They were becoming conscious of the weight of sin on their shoulders. Mark, what are we going to do? We've lied to the women. We've been deceitful. We've tricked them. What are we going to do? God is going to judge us for lying. On the other hand, if we tell the women, we will have great shame. It was not part of their culture for a man to ever apologize to a woman. After they became believers, the Mok men got the women together and told them how they had been deceiving them about the mask. And the women said, oh, we've known all along that it was just one of you men wearing that mask. Hmm. Basically, the women were playing their cultural part in order to stay alive. Now, don't think it wasn't serious. It really was. There are stories in their traditional culture 
of how one village wiped out another village because that village had revealed the secret of the mask to one of the women. Hmm. And, and so as you're teaching along in your, your chronological timeline, you finally come to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Yes. It's at that point that we tie together the Old and the New Testaments. It was then that the people realized that the lamb sacrifice you see in the Old Testament was only a picture of what Jesus did on the cross. There's a favorite scene on the Ital video that so many people have mentioned to me. Let's just watch it. Village leader stating that he too believes Christ has paid for his sins. Itau, which means it's true or it's good. It's very true. Village grandma rejoicing that he believes. So does she. Different ones giving testimony as to their belief in Christ as their sin bearer. Mark saying that if they really are believing, then God's word says that their sin is forgiven. Itau, it's good, it's true. Spontaneous rejoicing breaks out. This went on for two and a half hours. All the discouragement. All the tedious hours of language and culture study that we had faced seemed so insignificant. Those first few hours after we gave the gospel made it worth it all. Mark, the last thing that would have been on my mind that day was, what is the next step? But you, you've told me that on that day, something happened that became a landmark in the growth of these new believers. The rejoicing went on for quite a while. And here I am listening to these testimonies and watching all this rejoicing. And the thought comes to my mind of what a pastor shared with me back home. He said, Mark, the first thing I do is encourage new believers to share this good news of the gospel with others. He wanted them to do that before they discovered that a lot of Christians don't share their faith. And this thought comes to my mind while I'm standing there with all these new believers. So right in the middle of all this rejoicing, I asked some of the guys, when are you going to go and tell other villages about this good news? Well, everything goes quiet. So I asked them again. No one responded. No one. Now that just isn't the Mok way. They always respond to questions. So I asked them what they were thinking. Well, this one guy, Mendo, speaks up and says, yeah, we'll go, but we don't have a clue as how to go about it. And everyone is saying, yeah, we'll go, real enthused. So I said, that's all I want to know. I'll show you how. It was so refreshing to be around these new believers. Their faith was so simple. For example, not long after I was teaching in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, and I was reading about the apostles Peter and John giving their report to the church where it says, And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Well, here I am reading along about this God who is creator of all things, the sky, the earth, and I get down to verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. But just as I finished reading, this massive earthquake hits. And I ran out into the open, shouting for them to get out for fear something would follow them. And you know, they just sat there. Anopolis. I remember him because he had this big smell on his face and he was just looking around. They weren't concerned in the least. Their attitude was, yep, that's our God. He's just showing us how he shook the church back then, and he is showing us his power right now.
With the new honesty that existed among the people, a lot of relationships could now be mended that the old deceit had kept broken. Husbands began to show more love and concern for their wives. They stopped deceiving them, and wife beating became a thing of the past. Before, the men had spent a lot of time in the man house, often doing things leading to trouble. Now they began to spend more time with their wives. They began to take more responsibility for the children. These were good things, big changes. And of course, they were talking of taking this good message to the other village. In that first week after they became believers, these three guys showed up from a neighboring village and asked us if we would come and teach them. These guys have light in their eyes, but our eyes are just darkness. When we look into each other's eyes, we see nothing but darkness. But when we look into the eyes of these ones that have been taught, we see light. We want that light. Well, these guys began showing up every week, begging for us to come and teach them. So I thought, here's the opportunity for men from my village to learn to teach. Now, from the very beginning, you laid out a strategy that was based on teaching them to teach by example. And I have a little uh, diagram here. I'd like you to take this and just explain how you did that. Okay. The basic steps were like this. The second village we went to, I did all the teaching, and they helped me. The thing that really stood out was this. The new believers saw the way I was teaching was exactly the same as they had been taught. A to B, B to C, one step at a time. All the way through, it was the same story. Well, that really got the believers from the first village excited. So I began to get different ones of them to help me teach. They were pretty scared at first, but they did very well, and with time, they gained confidence. <laughs> At night, they would sit around in the village houses playing cassette tapes of the teaching, reviewing the stories taught up to that point. It was a real help. The third village we taught at, they did all the teaching and I helped them. I told the people that I would not be teaching them, but rather the believers from the first village would be doing the teaching. Well, the folks in village three didn't know how they felt about that. They didn't want the Moke teacher. They weren't sure if they would tell the story right. I told them that the Moke teachers would teach exactly the same message. Well, they still wanted me to teach, but I told them that was impossible as I was only one man and could not be in so many places at one time. It would have to be a Moke teacher or no one. There was no one else who could do it. Well, that changed their mind real fast, and that's the way it worked out. The moke from the first village did all the teaching, and I just helped them out. In the fourth village, the moke believers did all the teaching themselves, and I just watched. This is now extended to 12 villages. Yes, and from the fourth village on, all the teaching was done by the moke teachers. One of the biggest keys to the success of the multiplication of the teaching has been our literacy program. My wife Gloria developed this. The hunger for the Word of God can be exceedingly great, but if you don't have men and women who can read the Bible, then you don't have equipped teachers, and that means you have a problem. As fast as I've been able to translate material, we have run it off on the laser printer and made multiple photocopies. My daughter Nicole has often been involved with this. And we put it into the hands of the people. There is a lot more motivation for a person to learn to read if he has a variety of things to read. As we have developed literate people, we have encouraged them to write their own tribal stories in their language, and we've made those available as well. In all, we'd go through around 8,000 sheets of paper every month. 
Now, as these teachers went out to various new villages, it wasn't easy for them. We sometimes think that it is easier for indigenous tribal teachers, missionaries if you will, to leave their homes, but that's not so. They have their own land, their own gardens, their favorite hunting and fishing areas, their family and their friends. And often, the places they are going to are very strange to them. They are living among people that at one time fought against them, worked sorcery on them. Where they go is far from medical help that we provide. For them, it is a real sacrifice and it takes real commitment. I remember Tawa, one of our teachers. He said, you know, I really don't have to go. I could stay here. But I feel God wants me to go, and that is enough. And so they go. We have 15 trained literacy teachers and 42 Bible teachers. All in all, they are teaching in 12 villages. Okay, we've picked one of those villages, and taking the actual footage you shot, we've edited together a very brief clip. We'll pick up the story on the last day of the teaching as the teachers dramatize the life of Jesus. Now, there are some believers in the crowd that have come for this day, but most of those you see watching are unbelievers. Okay, this is Jesus being brought before Pilate. They're acting out the accusations against Jesus. They're saying, this man is an evil man. He's guilty. Pilate is asking, what the guy do? He's not convinced at this point that their accusations are true. And they're saying to Pilate, Whose friend are you? Are you the friend of this man or of Caesar? Do you want to be the friend of a bad man? They're beating and whipping Jesus. They don't do it hard enough to hurt. But because of the intensity, everyone gets the idea that Jesus was beaten pretty badly. All these men that are acting out this story have come from previous villages that have been evangelized. They're key believers, tremendous men. They drive the nails in right beside the feet and between the fingers. They use a plant dye mixed with water for the blood. It's very convincing. Here they are portraying the soldiers and the people who mock Christ. Hey, you there on the cross. You helped others. Come on. Why don't you help yourself? Woo! Come on down. Come on down off that tree if you're so powerful. Woo! You're just a liar. You're a deceiver. All you are is a faith. People have told me that when they see the mockers, it really grates on them. Here's God himself being shamed. Jesus is now dead, and the soldiers pierce his side with a spear. We have a bag filled with red dye that they pierce to symbolize his shed blood. For many, when they see the blood running out, they begin to connect it with the Old Testament sacrifice of the Lamb. One man told me when he saw the blood, he thought, Ah, Jesus is the true Lamb. I knew it, I knew it. Here, Jesus is being taken off the cross and put in the tomb. During all this time, one of the teachers is explaining in detail for the audience just what is going on. It is important they understand each segment of the drama. The bark door symbolizes the stone being rolled away. There you see the empty tomb. Mark, this is really great. And of course then you can emphasize that Jesus is truly alive. That's right. At the very end, we have Jesus giving the Great Commission telling us that we are to go into all the world and preach this good news to everybody. Now what you have here is a very excited teacher. His name is Tawa. He's so moved by the moment that he's having a hard time getting going. But what he's doing is going back into the Old Testament and showing how those accounts revealed what Christ came for. He starts right back in Genesis and works his way through the Old Testament bringing out the principle we find in Leviticus 17.11. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. 
And then in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. He's teaching on Abraham and Isaac and how a ram was offered in Isaac's place. This really drives home the whole idea of us being sinners under judgment, deserving to be punished, and then Jesus dying, shedding his blood to pay for our sin in our place. Okay, now some of the people have begun to catch on, and they're getting to their feet to testify that they believe Jesus died in their place for their sin. They're popping up all over, men, women and children. The teachers are asking them different questions to see if they've really understood. Mark, tell us, what are they saying? Okay. Today, I've heard the truth. I believe in the death and blood as the substitutionary payment for my sin. Jesus has taken my place and my sin is forgiven. The teacher asked him, if you were to die, what would happen to you? And he says, I'd go to heaven. Teacher says, why do you say that? And the man answers, because I really believe the death and the blood of Christ has taken my place for my sin. The testimonies all have a similar gist, but depending on who it is, the teachers tailor the question to that person. If the guy was really a self-righteous person in the past, then they'll try to find out if he's relying on anything that he has done to be saved. This is their own idea. Some of those children have really understood the teaching well. They are really sharp. Even the Moke teachers were amazed. They'd come back and say, Wow, some of these little children really know the answers. Even when some of the questions would stump the adults, these little guys would pop up with the right answer. All of a sudden, they run out and just start whooping. There's no cultural equivalence to this. It's just a result of a tremendous emotional release as they realize their sins are forgiven. The condemnation of sin, the guilt, the weight and darkness is gone. My family and I get in on it too. It's a bit hard to hold the camera still. This rejoicing went on for quite a while. And then it just seemed to hit them that all their family that has died in the past has gone into a Christless eternity. They started wailing. The grieving is really genuine. This hasn't happened at every place the teaching occurred, but it did here. They cried for a while, and then it gives way to singing songs and rejoicing again. Mark, what words are they singing? Well, the one they are singing goes like this. Today the true God has been gracious and merciful to us. Today the grace of God, which is very good, has come to us most people, and I believe in Him today. He, Jesus, Himself, is our true Lord and Master. There is no doubt that God has done wonderful things here in the Moog tribe. God is not finished. Indeed, what has happened is only a beginning. Men and women are still volunteering to go and teach God's word to other villages. The Moog have not only evangelized their own tribe, but now are reaching out to completely different language groups. Just like the apostles of old, they are sent, commissioned by the ones who will stay behind and support them. Then they pack up all their earthly belongings and off they go. They face tremendous obstacles. They have to make tremendous sacrifices. And yet they go. And still there are many more tribal language groups that have not had a missionary. The men you see here talking to Mark Zook are a delegation that have come looking for missionaries to live with them. They came from a completely different language group. Somehow I believe God intended them to know this good news too. Paul, the apostle, wrote these words 2,000 years ago. They still apply today. Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard, shall understand.
Just before we moved into the tribe back in 1984, a group of Mok men hiked out of the mountains. They came to one of our missionaries and said, we want the missionary to come and live with us. They meant business too. They had brought money, 20 kina. And the Mok had said, hey, listen, we want to buy a missionary. Today, the Mok wouldn't even think of buying what they finally got because now they know that the message of the Bible is about a free gift of salvation provided through Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And that is a bargain they can't help telling others about. Mark never taught the Mok people this song. He's not sure where they heard it. But our video crew found out that we only had to sing a song once for them to remember the tune. And to this particular tune, they put their own words to glorify God. Our camera crew could not be totally objective as we worked on this video just being among these people does affect you. I was standing at the back of a meeting when one of the video crew pointed out a little boy about 10 years of age. And this little guy was busy taking notes on the Bible lesson. He was meticulous. And it just struck me. I don't know that I've ever seen children in our Western churches taking notes like that. Then again, the last day we filmed an old man named Lepide. This old fellow was in such poor health, they didn't even know if he would survive the teaching the first time. But he did, and he became a believer. After the Mok teachers began to go to the other villages, he asked if he could go with them to teach the old people, making sure they understood each lesson. And this he has done, climbing mountains, crossing rivers, going from village to village to help teach the older folk. Take a good look at him. The next time you'll see him, you'll be in heaven. La Paide died only a few weeks after this footage was taken. You know, I do believe if the strength of a church was to be judged by its young and its old, then my conclusion would have to be that we should be the learners and the Mok believers should be our teachers.